Chapter 13 Moroccan Myths Fez and Agadir In the blazing hot summer of 1911, at the height of the tension between Asquith's government and the Lord of and the House of Lords, the secret elite deliberately took Europe to the brink of war by engineering a second crisis in Morocco. The reintroduction of Theophile de Classe Del Casse to the French cabinet marked a new era in their influence on French politics, as did the strategic switch of Alexander Zvolsky from St. Petersburg to Paris. Within weeks, France displayed renewed aggression in Morocco by finding a pretext to send in a large military force. When it became an army of occupation, Germany objected. It was virtually 1905 revisited. The secret elite conjured the myth in that Germany intended to build a naval base on the North African coast to threaten shipping lanes and so created an international storm. War was once more on the agenda. The 1906 Algeciras Act solemnly proclaimed Morocco's inter integrity and independence Though secret deals have subsequently enabled bankers, concession hunters, lab land grabbers, and speculators to slowly strangle the country. With British collusion and encouragement, the French systematically reduced the power of the Sultan's government and steadily siphoned off its wealth. Moroccan resources were placed in hock to interna international bankers with the entire customs revenues mortgaged to guarantee the interest paid to European bondholders on two major loans. The interest on a 1904 loan stood at 60%. A 1910 loan attracted interest at 40%. Morocco, like most African countries, was bled dry by international exploitation. The act had placed the Moroccan tribes under the joint jurisdiction of French and Spanish police forces, who proved very willing to crush any resistance. French brutality was relentless. In July of 1907, local tribesmen in Casablanca reacted violently when European work workmen removed gravestones from their native cemeteries to build a new harbor. French battleships retaliated by bombarding the town. Nearly every inhabitant was killed or wounded at the death to, and the death toll numbered thousands. It was an episode of spiteful revenge and a gross overreaction to the killing of nine European workers, including three Frenchmen. France took the opportunity to assert its imperial control by sending in 15,000 troops with an order to enforce prompt and vigorous repression an indemnity of two and a half million francs was imposed on the KU, KIU, 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 KIU tribes. Cha Uyas was imposed, two and a half million francs was imposed on the Cha Uyas tribe because they had made war against France by killing three French workmen. It was a fearsome reprisal. French troops occupied Casablanca and a wide area around it. Typically, after the bombardment of the city, the French extracted 12 million from the Moroccan government to cover the cost of their retribution. Lies about the incident were spread across the globe the killing of nine foreign workers who had desecrated a Muslim burial ground was reported as a massacre in Morocco. The Daily Mail raised the specter of a holy war and claimed that the massacre had been premeditated and organized. Within three weeks, the French claim was that the Moorish ports must stay in the hands of civilization Little mention was ever made of the extensive brutality of the French response. The New York Times reported that
that impartial observers believe that the French had gone to Casablanca to stay. They are repeating the history of the Americans in Cuba and the Philippines, of the French in Indochina, and of the English in Egypt. They all started by fighting the natives and ended by keeping the country. The impartial observers were absolutely correct. The French Chamber of Deputies had on nine occasions between 1906 and 1911 passed resolutions by large majorities expressing its determination to uphold the Algeciras Act and disclaiming intervention in the international affairs of Morocco. Like the British parliamentarians, the French were completely misled and had no knowledge of secret agreements. They believed that they were in charge of foreign policy, but as the British MP and journalist E.D. Morel revealed, policy was being persuaded by wire pullers behind the scenes. The secret elite's chief wire puller in France, the irresp irrepressible Theophile Delcasse, was brought back into the French cabinet as Minister of Marine in early March of 1911. It was a greater tragedy that anyone could have imagined. The man forced to resign for taking France to the brink of war with Germany during the first Moroccan crisis was back in government and placed in charge of the French Navy. The Frenchman had been described as an instrument of the late King Edward VII, and though Del Casse was not officially involved in foreign policy, the Belgian ambassador, Baron Grandil, 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 the Belgian ambassador, Baron Grandil, considered him far too ambitious and relentless a man not to try to impress his ideas upon his colleagues. He would almost seem to have been invited to do so. By whom? Whose influence was used to revive the Ravenschist? Del Casse's impact was felt immediately. Ambassador Grandil noted that the president of the French Senate began to speak more openly of revanche openly of revanche than he had for years and the French newspaper found some cause or other for daily complaint against Germany. As soon as Del Casse returned to public office, France employed a policy of aggression in Morocco. It was not a coincidence. Neither was Alexander Izvolsky's appearance in France in Paris as the newly appointed Russian ambassador to France. Izvolsky, who had stirred the Balkans in 1908 and craved Russian control of Constantinople, joined El Casse, whose life's ambition was the return of Alice Lorraine, Alsace Lorraine. Both were inextricably, inextricably linked to the secret elite. Izvolsky believed that he, he could more effectively orchestrate war against Germany from his base in Paris rather than the foreign office in St. Petersburg. The day after his return to the French cabinet, Del Casse met Izvolsky, who described him as the most prominent member of the cabinet. He added that Del Casse saw his first task as the provision of a strong fleet and would ensure that the cabinet would redouble its efforts in regard to the army. Although his given post was Minister of Marine, Del Casse's forceful and dominating personality swamped the French foreign minister, Jean Croppy, who was entirely without diplomatic experience. Del Casse was back, and he meant business. In Morocco, native discontent came to a head in the spring of 1911, when the French publicly executed Moroccan deserters. Allegedly, a revolt took place in the city of Fez. Alarming reports were generated by the French that the lives of Europeans in the almost inaccessible Moroccan capital were in danger. 
French and British newspapers flooded the public with exaggerated stories of an entire European colony living in great fear and anguish. The ultimate fate of the women and children was, was described in most moving terms. Rebels had allegedly encircled Fez with a ring of iron and flame. There was talks of an international crisis, possibly war. It read like a French mafia king. Under the pretext of impending atrocities, a large mil French military contingent was sent to Fez on the 5th of April. Jules Cambone, the French ambassador in Berlin, notified the Germans that a punitive expedition to rescue the Europeans would make it necessary for them to occupy the port of Rabat before moving into the interior of Morocco. Cambone promised that France would respect the Treaty of Algeciras and withdraw her troops as soon as order had been restored. General Mounier reached the Moroccan capital at the head of the French expeditionary force in early May. He found the city perfectly quiet and the Europeans unmolested. The rebels and the, their ring of iron and flame had apparently disappeared like the morning dew. The phantom so, dexter so dexterously conjured, the phantom so dexterously conjured, had disappeared in the night. The whole story had been concocted for devious purposes. On the 2nd of May, John de Leon, the leading Irish home ruler, asked the foreign secretary in the House of Commons if the government had received any reports that British agents had received any reports from British agents in Morocco that Europeans in Fez were in danger or were unable to escape the, from Fez if they desired to do so, and had the British government any information to the effect that the Emperor of Morocco had sanctioned the advance of the European troops on Fez. Sir Edward Grey avoided a straight answer. He retreated into a response that placed all responsibility for information about Fez on a verbal report from the French government. Keir Hardy weighed into the attack by asking about an international syndicate that was trying to gain control of Morocco's mineral wealth. Sir Edward Grey ignored the question. He simply didn't give an answer. He knew that there were only 10 British citizens in Fez, including six women and two children. He knew there was no significant European colony. Equally, he knew that there had been no Moroccan attacks on Europeans. The secret elite encouraged the French military invasion of Morocco purely to elicit a German response and bring about the desired international crisis. And what better excuse than to challenge the mining rights that the Sultan had given to a German company which conflicted with the interests of the French Union des mine Moroccans in the guise of rescuing Europeans from a non-existing crisis? Even after the reality of the situation became commonly known, Gray persisted in lying. His memoirs recorded that Fez was in danger and France was forced to send troops there to relieve the situation and prevent catastrophe. Baron Grendel te telegraphed Brussels on the 10th of May. Since the act of Algeciras, little by little the French have gotten possession of everything, taking advantage of incidents which have arisen automatically and creating other openings when they were needed. Can the expedition now be regarded as anything else than anything else other than an act of the same farce? Sultan Mulai Hafid has already lost his precarious hold over his subjects because he had to submit to become a mere tool in the hands of France. The perceptive Belgian diplomat was absolutely correct. 
France treated the Algeciras agreement like waste paper. It continued to conquer Morocco by a direct military action and piecemeal occupation. It fomented internal discord and strangled the revenues of the Moorish government. The secret elite encouraged every step the French took while Europe was dragged nearer and nearer to the abyss. Baron Grendel observed that the most interesting feature in this in the forbearance with which the gov- with 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 which the German government pretends to ignore the conquest of Morocco. She can choose between pretending not to see and war, which the emperor will not have and which would be condemned by German public opinion. There was no appetite for war in Germany. The clamor for action, the undisguised overreaction, was entirely one-sided. Indeed, Kaiser Wilhelm, who believed that life was at risk in Fez, initially welcomed the French intervention to stabilize and sultanate. By the close, by the close of June, the entire country between the capital and the coast had been overrun by French troops. When it became clear that the French army had no intention of leaving Fez, Germany reached the end of her patience. She complained that, despite assurances to the contrary, France was ignoring the Algeciras Act and ignoring German interest in Morocco with contemptuous disrespect. The, a symbolic protest was required, and on the 1st of July, a German warship on its voyage home from southern Africa was rerouted to Agadir, a hitherto, a hitherto unknown town on the Atlantic coast of Morocco. The Panther was a gunboat of a thousand tons carrying two 10.5 caliber guns, six machine guns, and 125 men. In stark contrast to the wanton destruction meted out by the French Navy on Casablanca, the small German gunboat anchored off the coast, fired no shots, and landed none of its crew. Yet it was the Panther that drew all the venom. At the same time, Germany presented a note to the French government stating that their occupation of Fez was incompatible with the Algeciras Agreement. Respect for the sovereignty of the Sultan and the integrity of Morocco. The German government was prepared to discuss a solution to the Moroccan question and willing to listen to any sensible proposal. Germany made it clear that she was not she would not ask anything exorbitant of France and had neither landed men at Agadir nor had any intention of doing so. She was seeking clarity and compensation, not war. Although Britain had no territorial interest in Morocco, a wave of outraged anti-German bile filled the British press. Winston Churchill's view was that the Panther at Agadir was part of an untimely German attempt to set up a naval base from which it could attack Allied shipping en route to the Canary Islands in South Africa. It was an absurd suggestion, not least because the coast of Agadir had no deep water harbor. Sir Edward Grey would later resurrect resurrect the old chestnut that the panther incident was yet another German attempt to break the Entente Cordiale intended to provoke war with France. The warmongers breathed fire and brimstone against Germany. Edward Grey urged the French Prime Minister to adapt a, to adopt a belligerent attitude that would probably have led to war had he yielded to the advice. In a moment of supreme irony, Sir Arthur Nicholson, permanent undersecretary at the Foreign Office since 1910, complained to the, Germans, to the German ambassador in London that in anchoring the panther off Agadir, Germany was violating the act of Algeciras. He made no mention of the fact that France and Spain had already 100,000 troops occupying the country. 
The Times, on the 20th of July, warned menacingly that Germany was claiming absolute European predominance, and Gray personally blamed Germany for creating a new situation. According to his memoirs, Germany sent the gunboat to Agadir suddenly after the French force entered Fez, but in truth Germany had waited for almost two months while trying her best to resolve the situation through diplomacy. Despite that, Sir Hugh Strachan, Emeritus Professor of the History of War at Oxford University and a Fellow of All Souls, wrote in 2003, what had been a Franco-German dispute about colonial ambitions designed to be resolved by diplomacy now became an issue of vital national interest to Britain. Germany had deployed sea powers beyond the purlieus of its immediate geographical waters. This was a direct threat to the premier navy in the world. Consider, please, the outrageous nature of this statement. A small German gunboat with a crew of 125 was painted as a direct threat to the premier navy in the world and its presence as an issue of vital national interest to Britain. Six days before the Panther dropped anchor in the Atlantic off Agadir, the entire British navy had paraded in a coronation review of the fleet at Spithead, 167 warships with an aggregate tonnage of over a million tons manned by 60,000 officers and men, the largest fleet ever assembled at the time, covering 18 square miles and arranged in five long main lines, with smaller lines filled with destroyers, submarines with torpedo craft. Submarines and torpedo craft had been ceremonially inspected by the king on board, HMY Victoria and Albert III. The Panther was barely a thousand tons. The royal yacht was almost five times heavier itself. Seen in the light of historical reality, Strachan's statement is absurd. Like many of his contemporaries, Professor Strachan makes no mention of the secret treaties that carved up Morocco. The American writer Frederick Bossman suggested that it is a good test of writers who discuss the cause of the war, how they refer to the secret treaty of 1904. If they omit or do not reasonably discuss the secret party of the treaty, they must be viewed with caution. Good advice. In the midst of diplomatic discussion between Germany and France, the Times kept up a barrage of protests. Its editorials and Paris dispatches were characterized by verbal violence. On the 20th of July, the newspaper stated that Germany was making outrageous demands upon France and that no British government would tolerate them, even if the French government were found feeble enough to do so. The new French premier, Joseph Kylox, Joseph Kylox, was placed under great pressure to concede nothing to the Germans. The Times pressed for the dispatch of British warships to Agadir. Every possible avenue was explored by the secret elite to promote their war with Germany. The following day, Sir Edward Grey summoned the German ambassador, adopted the same tone as the Times, and reiterated the facts. Grey hinted, that it might be necessary to take steps to protect British interests. That same evening, the Chancellor of the Exchequer was due to speak to the Bankers Association in London. Before leaving for the Mansion House, Lord George went to seek the Prime Minister's approval for the content of his speech. According to Lord George, the Prime Minister immediately called Sir Edward Grey to the Cabinet Room to obtain his views and procure his sanction. While it was unusual for Ministers of the Crown to make important speeches out with their normal sphere of responsibility, Lord George was not known to seek permission from anyone f before speaking his mind. Bluntly put this, bluntly put, 
This was not his normal way. Yet here he was, inside the cabinet office with Asquith and Gray, rehearsing a hymn that came from their liberal imperialist hymnal, not his nonconformist origins. In the plethora of interventions, protests, and counterclaims, this one stood out above all. It was a moment of great significance. David, Lord jo David Lloyd George abandoned the fundamental convictions on which his golden reputation had been forged. The man of the people, the man who above all stood for peace and retrenchment, the man who buried the conservative party in the mire of the Boer War, shook off the robes of pacifism and joined the horsemen of the apocalypse. With carefully chosen words, he warned, I would make great sacrifices to preserve peace, but were a situation to be forced upon us, by which peace could only be preserved by the surrender of the great and beneficent position Britain has won by centuries of heroism and achievement, by allowing Britain to be treated where her interests were vitally affected as if she were of no account in the cabinet of nations, then I say emph emphatically that peace at that price would be a humiliation intolerable for a great country like ours to endure. National honor is no party question. The security of our great international trade is no party question. The peace of the world is more likely to be secured if all nations realize that the conditions of peace must be. What he said reverberated across Europe. St. Paul's companions could hardly have been more surprised on the road to Damascus. The words may read mildly, but Lloyd George had drawn a line in the sand and crossed over on to the dark side. The security of our international trade is no party question. What did he mean? How could a gunboat anchored off the Moroccan coast threaten the security of Britain's international trade? It was nonsense. A complete non-event, yet he was deliberately whipping up a storm of protest. What situation was being forced upon us, Britain, that in What situation was being forced upon Britain that involved the surrender of the great position Britain had won by centuries of heroism. What was he talking about? This was the rhetoric of pure imperialism from Lloyd George. Tellingly, in his personal memoirs, Sir Edward Grey considered that there was nothing in the words that Germany could fairly resent. Germany. It was, of course, aimed at Germany, a dark warning from the former champion of peace. The gunboat panther sitting off Agadir justified nothing that Lloyd George had said. A senior member of the British cabinet made a serious, if veiled, threat to Germany in the knowledge and expectation that she would resent it. Riling Germany into a dangerous reaction was, of course, the whole point of the exercise. Paul Cambone, French ambassador to London, Later admitted frankly to Lord, to Lloyd George, it was your speech of July 1911 that gave us the certainty that we could count upon England. The secret elite wanted war and were preparing for it. If it could be arranged for July or August of 1911, it would have, called, it would have cut across the hated Parliament bill and brought legislation to a halt. The crisis of the Constitution would instantly be replaced by the unifying crisis of war in Europe. British naval and military preparations were stepped up. Army officers were recalled from leave, additional horses purchased for the cavalry, and the North Sea Squadron placed, a war, placed on a war footing. On the morning after Lloyd, Lord, on the morning after Lloyd George's speech, the Times printed his inflammatory words in two articles in the same issue with accentuated notes and headlines. It hailed his decisive and statement-like references to Germany and portrayed him as a national savior. 
Europe had nothing to lose by his revelations on the true pretensions of Germany. On the true pretensions of Germany. The importance of the Times editorial blamed the fact that on the, con on the continent of Europe, it was correctly held to represent the views of those in control of the British Foreign Office. The furious campaign followed in Britain newspaper and magazine, British newspapers and magazines, and raged for three months. A furious, a furious campaign followed in British newspapers and magazines and raged for three months. Germany protested strongly about the in, insinuations and the hallucinations that were being considered establishing a naval base at Agadir. Agadir. The German note of complaint to Sir Edward Grey concluded, If the English government intended complicating and upsetting the political situation, and leading to an explosion, they certainly could have not could not have chosen a better means than the Chancellor of the Exchequer speech. The entire Moroccan crisis had been set up to provoke Germany into war. That was not so startling, but that Lloyd George allowed himself to be used as the mouthpiece of the secret elite to fuel the flames of hatred against Germany most certainly was the most most certainly was to most observers. Was this the moment for which his conversion had been carefully prepared? An initial down payment to the secret elite who had rescued his career in 1909? If Britain had successfully engineered war in 1911, Lloyd George would have presented himself as the man of the people who had tried to warn Germany off. With every passing day, he grew closer to the Relugus Three. Inside Asquith's cabinet, Charles Hobhouse certainly noted a much closer relationship between L Lloyd George and Sir Edward Grey. Lloyd George was not the only new face in the inner circles of real power. He and Winston Churchill were brought quietly into the secret subcommittee of the CID that was responsible for the joint Anglo-French preparations for war, a sure sign of their standing with the secret elite. Asquith waited until Parliament had risen for the summer recess and ministers and backbenchers had left the sultry and opp oppressive city before summoning both men to a secret war meeting. This was an unprecedented act. It was a war briefing to be there in the company of the Director of Military Operations, General Wilson, and Fisher's successor as First Lord, as First Sea Lord, Admiral Arthur Wilson, with the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, the First Lord of the Admiralty, and the Secretary of State for War would have shaken lesser spirits. Not Churchill nor Lloyd George, both of whom had previously given these colleagues a hard time in Cabinet questioning military and naval spending plans and the cost of reorganization, they had no idea what had been happening behind closed doors of the War Office and the Foreign Office. But on the 23rd of August, 1911, it was deemed that they had, to, they had a need to know and could be trusted to pursue the Imperial cause. That meeting was their initiation into a select fellowship who knew and understood that Britain was preparing for war with Germany? The only question remained to be answered was, was now the time? The meeting lasted all day. Great maps were produced and the details of the German Schleifen plan were demonstrated with amazing accuracy. General Wilson, later Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, was a dedicated and far-sighted soldier. He had been working since 1906 on one project to support the French army in a war against Germany. He knew the French general staff and their army dispositions. Secret information was regularly relayed to him from the continent and his own office was plastered with a gigantic map of Belgium on which every road, milepost, railway junction River and Canal had been identified following his 
reconnaissance. Following his reconnaissance trip through the Belgian countryside. So it would start in Belgium then. So it would start in Belgium then. Three full years before the event, the Committee of Imperial Defense was taken through a meticulously accurate explanation of how war was to begin in 1914. Churchill was deeply excited by the prospect of war and with his customary conceit sent a memorandum to the CID forecasting how he imagined the first 40 days of a continental war would proceed. In the event, his prognosis proved uncannily accurate. The presentation by the first sea lord, Sir Arthur Wilson, was in complete contrast, vague and singularly unimpressive. The Admiralty remained absolutely fixed on Fisher's view that a closed blockade of enemy ports would be much more effective than the landing of an expeditionary force. He advocated keeping the armies prepared for counter-strikes on the German coast that would draw troops from the front line. It soon became obvious that there was no agreed naval war plan at all. Basically, there was a fundamental impasse between the, Royal, between the Navy and the military staff. Between the naval and military staffs. To be fair, a closed blockade of the Channel and North Sea ports would have had a deadly impact on Germany's capacity to wage a longer war. But other influences ruled out such a strategy. Haldane was furious. Despite all of his sterling reorganization at the war office, it was absolutely clear to everyone in that room that if war was declared in 1911, Britain would be, want Britain would be found wanting. They did, not, they did not have a plan of action agreed between the joint services. The experience of attending the Committee of Imperial Defense stirred in Churchill, a zeal that fired his imagination. There was going to be a war, and it could be very soon. He recorded that every preparation was made for war. The railway timetables for the movement of every battalion, even where they were to drink their coffee, were meticulously prepared. An ongoing railway strike ended abruptly after a confidential statement was sent from Lloyd George to owners and worker representatives. Thousands of maps of northern France and Belgium were printed for the expeditionary force. The press maintained a studied silence. Everything had to be organized in secret. Churchill wrote a detailed letter to Gray and Asquith on the 30th of August advising them on what to do if and when the Moroccan negotiations fail. He actually believed that war was about to break out over Morocco. His advice to Sir Edward Grey was to tell Belgium that if her neutrality is violated, we are prepared to come to her aid and to make an alliance with France and Russia to guarantee her independence. Tell her that we will take whatever military steps that, we, that will be most effective for that purpose. Yet again, the war planners brought Belgium into the question. It had always been destined to provide the excuse for taking up arms against Germany. Winston Churchill was consumed by war fever, and for a few days in late summer, war seemed probable. In France, the radical Joseph Kylox remained calm. He had formed his government in late June and withstood the pressure from the secret elite's men. Gray in London and Del Casse in Paris, Caliox favored conciliation rather than war. His socialist policies included the introduction of income tax, improved housing, and the nationalization of the railways. Franco-German negotiations began in July and finally found a solution in the Treaty of Fez in November of 1911, by which France was given a free hand in Morocco in return for a guarantee that Germany's economic interests in that country would be safeguarded. 
Germany was, in addition, granted territorial compensation in the French Congo. As usual, it was an imperialist carve-up that denied the indigenous people of Morocco and the Congo any say in the matter. In November of 1911, two Paris newspapers, Le Temp and Le Matin, revealed the details of the secret articles in the 1904 Entente, behind which Britain claimed to uphold the independence and integrity of Morocco while allowing France and Spain to abuse that country. The issue of Fez was a lie. The treaties and acts at Algeciras had been signaled in bad faith. The indignation raised against Germany was founded on falsehood. In the December issue of the Review of Reviews, William T. Stead wrote a warning that was ignored at great cost. We all but went to war with Germany. We have escaped war, but we have not escaped the natural and abiding enmity of the German people. It is possible to frame a heavier indictment on the foreign policies of any British ministry. The secret, the open secret of this almost incredible crime against treaty faith, British interests, and the peace of the world is the unfortunate fact that Sir Edward Grey has been dominated by men at the Foreign Office who believe all considerations must be subordinated to the one supreme duty of Thor in Germany at every turn even if in so doing British interests, treaty faith, and the peace of the world are trampled underfoot. I speak that of which I know. He did, as an initiator of the World Secret Society, Stead certainly spoke with unequaled authority. He had been part of them, worked for them, but ultimately rejected their warmongering philosophy. This was one of the very few occasions that someone who had been connected with the secret elite gave us a glimpse behind the curtain. Stead confirmed the point that we have made before. The men who dominated Sir Edward Grey and British foreign policy, Milner and his round table, were at the core of the secret elite. They believed that it was their supreme duty, and as acolytes of Ruskin, they would have focused on the word duty to defeat Germany, even if peace of the world itself was trampled underfoot. Stead knew precisely what he was exposing, the British race zealots who sought world domination. Thanks to both Kaiser Wilhelm and Premier Joseph Kaliox, the second Moroccan crisis passed, as had the first, without recourse to war. It was the secret elite who were thwarted, but they had learned further. French politics had not been profitably corrupted. Del Casse had been rehabilitated and was impressively influential, influential, but more was needed. They had to control the prime minister or the president of France. A staunch ravenchist was required in the Elysee Palace. Kaliox and his social radicals would have to go. Alexander Zvolsky had been successfully transferred to Paris and had made immediate contact with Del Casse. It was a partnership that promised much but would require greater resources to bribe politicians as well as the press. Nearer to home, Haldane had created his military staff and an army ready for instant action, but the Navy despite relentless investment, was disjointed. The Admiralty wanted to act alone. It knew better than everyone else. Both of these problems required firm solutions. Summary, Chapter 13, Moroccan Myths, Fez and Agadir. Despite the guarantees given to the Algeciras Act, given in the Algeciras Act, Moroccan independence and integrity were contin continually eroded by the French. Retribution against the local inhabitants at Casablanca in 1907 was grossly disproportionate and unnecessarily brutal. The French chamber was completely misled by Morocco and had no knowledge of the secret agreements. Two major secret elite agents, 
Del Casse and Izvolsky were the wire pullers influencing French foreign policy from 1911. A mythical rebellion at Fez was concocted and a large French military force sent to the city. Germany accepted the French promise that this was a temporary measure and that the troops would be removed as soon as peace had been restored. Despite these promises, it became an army of occupation, and Germany objected by sending a small gunboat to Algidir. The secret elite blew this out of purport blew this out of all proportion with wild claims that Germany aimed to threaten sea lanes by establishing a naval base at Agadir. Their ludicrous propaganda claimed that Germany intended to push Europe into war. Lloyd George, once considered the arch-radical and pacifist, joined the warmongers by making a deliberately antagonistic speech that aimed to rob Germany. Lloyd George and Winston Churchill were drawn into the secret elite's fold when the long-standing plans for war against Germany were shared with them. War against Germany were shared with them. British preparation for war had been ongoing since 1906, down to the smallest detail. War was imminent. In France, the recently elected Joseph, Premier Joseph Calliox rejected the warmongering and enter negotiations with Germany. The Kaiser and his ministers, while shocked by the malicious nature of the stories in the British press, refused to take the bait and agreed a diplomatic resolution. Thwarted the secret elite, thwarted the secret elite realized that they would need to take complete control of the French government.